Welcome to the Perspectives on Healthcare podcast, where members of the medical community from different roles, venues, and locations share their unique perspectives on quality healthcare, its future, and how to improve it. Now, from the Your Keynote Speaker Studio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Rob Oliver. Thank you, and welcome to another edition of Perspectives on Healthcare. Today's perspective comes from Rana Bitar. She is a hematologist and oncologist. She is a member of Generation X. And Rana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's jump right in here and tell me a little bit about yourself and your role in healthcare, please. Sure. Um, I was born, raised, and educated in Damascus, Syria. I came to the U.S. in 1990 for my medical training, and I eventually specialized in hematology and oncology, uh, which means I treat patients with uh, cancer and blood disorders. And I've been in practice in upstate New York for about 22 years. I'm also a poet and a writer. Uh, I completed a master in English and creative writing a few years ago. Um, I have published poems and essays in many journals. I have a book uh, of poetry published in 2019, and I have one coming up next year. And I just published a few months ago a nonfiction book, about uh, one book about my experience as an oncologist. Fantastic. Congratulations on the books, and I wish you much success with that. Um, So tell me, yeah, as far as hematology and oncology go, um, are you dealing mostly with lab results? Are you dealing like do you how much of an interaction do you are you able to have with the patients and how much of it is kind of doing testing and, and that kind of thing that's removed from the patients? Yeah, it is it is a, f- a full perspective of uh, of oncology. I see patients um, examine them, uh, the, take their history, do lab results, read their scans, treat them, talk to them. Uh, so it's a hundred percent interaction with patients, with uh, uh, in conjunction with analyzing their lab data and their studies and the pathology reports and all of that. Okay, uh, what does quality healthcare mean to you? Well, there is a universal definition of quality healthcare, which is usually defined as having access to qualified healthcare professionals who will administer care safely and according to standardized measures. But in oncology, quality care takes a step further, in my opinion. A lot of oncologists can provide the appropriate level of knowledge and follow treatment guidelines. Uh, But an oncologist needs not only to treat disease. um, I think they also need need to be healers. Um, Cancer is a life-altering experience, and it could be the mark that may tell a patient they have a few months or a few years to live. And many patients faced with such a serious realization, they really don't have time or energy to organize their thoughts and refocus on the prospect of looking at quality rather than quantity. So as a healer, uh, an oncologist can help their patient accept their vulnerability, um, they can usher them from a state of pain and devastation to a state of realization and focused on the moment. Um, so they can examine their lives and their priorities and start thinking about the things they probably always shelved, like uh, relationships they never had or trips they didn't make or words they didn't say. So I think if an oncologist can do that, they can elevate the quality of care they provide to their patients. Um, In my opinion, being a healer in oncology is as important, if sometimes not more important than being a doctor. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that your work as an oncologist involves not just looking at cancer cells and not just looking at, you know, blood you know, blood composition and so on, but you're also looking at the, you know, the psychosocial elements of it. And you're, I, I'm curious, are you working with people in their families as well? Or, it, you know, because that's 
what you talked about is, you know, relationships that they didn't have or things that they should have said or, you know, that kind of thing. Does that element enter into the care that you're providing as well? Well, naturally, when you deal with patients with cancers, you're always in close contact with their families. I mean, it's, it's not only them in the room when I see them or, or when I talk to them on the phone. There's a whole uh, aspect of dealing with them and uh, their position in their family and their work and all of that. So it always naturally involves their family members and sometimes their friends, sometimes their neighbors. Uh, so it extends beyond the, the, the patient themselves. Okay. Um, can you give me an example of quality health care? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, in oncology, delivering quality care does not only mean treating each case appropriately and safely, but also treating each case as individual human experience with with its sets of challenges and difficulties that are specific to that patient. And, and that involves getting closer to patients' emotional struggles and listening to their suffering uh, and trying to understand their personal philosophy about life and death. Um, so, so an example, say you have three patients with lung cancer with the same stage and the same treatment options. Um, an oncologist can go in a room and, and present the evidence-based treatment plan to each patient according to the national guidelines. But these patients are not the same people. Um, one patient might be a healthy grandfather whose goal in life is to spend quality time with their with his grandchildren and it's summertime and he wants to go to the beach or amusement park with them and he doesn't want to lose his hair. Uh, it's, uh, it's important to him not to make the young kids feel anxious about him. So I listen to him and I understand his, his uh, point of view. Uh, I don't ridicule or discredit his concerns about his hair, so we list the treatment options. And although the one that would not involve losing his hair is not the best based on your clinical evidence-based data, but we go with it because what's important to him at that moment is not the higher response, but the, the chance of not going bald. Uh, same, same situation, the second patient with the same stage of cancer, same treatment options, but this one is young and uh, he has to work to support his family uh, he's the breadwinner, um, so we work his chemo regimen around his work schedule. Uh, he's worried that his wife doesn't understand why he's tired and why he can't do what he used to do with the kids. Um, so I bring them in and we talk about what she can do to help him, what she should cook at home, what she should tell her kids about where, why their father is not being as active with them. Um, and we bring to light all the possible collateral concerns that, and that is a lot of, a lot of the tremendous pressure the family can go through during such a challenging time. Um, third patient, same, same type of cancer, same stage, but this one is, is an older patient. He has dementia and he can't make his own decision about does he want to go through treatment or he wants to opt for, for supportive care. Uh, and the family needs to make that decision for him. So I meet with with his daughter, and we talk about the treatment options, the possible side effects, and most importantly, we talk about him, about the patient, about his life prior to his diagnosis with dementia. What what was his philosophy, his values, and based on that, we conclude that if he were to make his own decision, he he probably wouldn't want to receive chemo. And uh, we opted to enroll him in supportive care program. These are three examples of what quality of care is not about only, especially in oncology, it's not about a, a, an algorithm that you go through. It's about individualizing what each patient needs and what their priority and what would be best for them at that, at that time. Right. So, again, what I'm hearing you say is that quality health care is really dependent on the patient and what their goals are and making sure that the health outcomes match with what with the stage of life that they're at and with their goals in life. Uh, can I mm -hmm. can I just get you to, to clarify something for me? You had talked about sure. as an 
as an oncologist being a healer. And mm -hmm. my sense is that mm -hmm. you don't mean just healing people from cancer. It involves a different type of healing than just healing disease. A am yeah, I correct? Abs absolutely. It's, it's the conjunction. It's not only administering chemo and talking to them about their diseases, but also talking to them about their their life around that disease. So it's not one or the other. It, it's the complementation of the medical, you know, the, the medications and the administration of treatment. It, it has to be complemented with understanding the patient's philosophy and their priority, but not instead, obviously. Got it. What do you wish people understood about your role in healthcare? Well, in some circles, oncologists are looked at as toxic chemo pushers who keep uh, pushing drugs even if it's futile. I, uh, I actually have patients who would go to the ER for, like, cholecystectomy if they have gallbladder disease, and they get told that, oh, well, they have cancer, they better go on hospice and forget about it. And some of the healthcare providers still operate in, in years past analogy in that, in that regard. Uh, you know, having cancer is no longer a six-month death sentence as it used to be with, with the new treatments that we have. Uh, I'm seeing patients with brain metastasis, living with cancer, good quality of life. They watch their kids uh, getting married. They, they meet their grandkids. So I wish that people in the healthcare system don't rush into giving patients ultimatums based on outdated information. Uh, just let the oncologists do their work and talk to their patients because they know them best. You know, you bring up a buzzword that really, um, it really hits home with me, and it's the concept of quality of life. And really, the question becomes, who determines quality of life? And for me, listen, I'm a person with a disability, okay? I'm a quadriplegic. I use a power wheelchair. And there are a lot of people that would look at me and say, you know, I that I have a low quality of life, but I live my life and I've got a high quality. I'm very satisfied with the things that I am able to accomplish and the, you know what I'm able to do. And so um, I think that you're, what you're alluding to is the fact that it, sometimes medical professionals are evaluating what they think a person's quality of life is. And it's, that's not necessarily accurate. It really depends on their own outlook and their own experience to determine quality of life. Does that make sense at all? It, it makes all sense, yes. I think quality of life is not determined by the healthcare providers. It, it's determined by the patients. What does it mean to them to live a quality of life? And that varies tremendously between patients and their background and their philosophy. It, it can't be determined by their doctors, absolutely not. I, you know, I've had patients telling me that their quality of life is not to come into the office every week for blood tests. And, and I have patients telling me that their quality of life means that they feel confident that they're doing everything to fight their disease, even if it means they spend hours every, every week in a, in a chemo room. So it varies tremendously and it, it can only be determined by the patients themselves and not, not the doctors. Thank you for sharing that. What excites you about the future of healthcare? What excites me is the medical innovations um, that now give us much hope uh, to what otherwise used to be helpless situations, from gene therapy to mRNA technology uh, to um, biotech breakthroughs. Also, what excites me is the availability of knowledge at the tips of my fingers because, you know, in, in oncology, things change pretty fast. Every day there is new study, new trials, new medications, and having the accessibility to be on top of all the recent information is, is a blessing to me. Yeah, that's so, so true. And I would imagine that your patients have similar experience in which there is information and knowledge available to them, you know, as close as the nearest uh, computer or smartphone where they can Google something. And I would imagine that you're mm -hmm. finding that patients today have at least the opportunity to be more informed about their own care than, than they ever have in the past. 
Yes, I, I think it goes both ways. They have definitely more opportunity to be informed, but also sometimes they, they get misinformed by the wealth of information they have. So this is where your, your role as an oncologist comes to clarify to them what's, what's a valid information that they read what, and what's not. Uh, but definitely, it's, uh, you know, the, the access to, to information is, is tremendous these days, and it's very helpful. Very true. So what is one thing medical professionals can start doing today to improve the quality of healthcare? Well, I wish there, is, there was one thing that could be done to improve the quality of care. I think many things need to come together uh, to do that. Some should come from the outside that uh, we don't have much control about as, as doctors, like uh, like changing the role of insurance companies uh, in dictating what doctors could do or couldn't do, uh, changing the formula of drug coverage and uh, copay programs, like improving quality of uh, electronic medical records to avoid redundancy and duplication. But, but the one thing that doctors can do today um, is really to restore the sacred doctor-patient relationship of trust and respect. Um, that's sadly uh, been put on a shelf and replaced by either, you know, as I mentioned before, misinformation on Google or relying on, on some uh, other media's information. Uh, and, and I think to do that, doctors should, should start being more engaged in their uh, patients with a close humanistic level and, and, and deep empathy. You know, tell me more about that concept that you mentioned of the sacredness of the doctor-patient relationship. What does that mean to you? Well, it means to me that when a patient comes in, um, they are, especially for from my experience with cancer patients, they are scared. They are, you know, they the minute they learn they have cancer, they by the time they come to me, they had Googled hundred sites and websites and information and, and, and information about drugs and all of that. And, and they're confused. I mean, they, they have all this data thrown at them from every angle and, and they can't maneuver all of it to, to kind of figure out what to do. And, and, and unless they, when they come into their oncologist, they feel that the oncologist understanding them and hearing them and, and has compassion to their concern, uh, unless they start trusting that the, their best interest is on his or her mind, uh, they get lost in all this information that they have. Uh, so I think that sacred relationship is very important between the doctor and patient and that comes with time and, and with a close relationship, again, especially in oncology, because it is very hard for a patient to maneuver all this information that are available everywhere. Um, and, and, you know, with, with, with your cancer patients, you see them very often, and you, I see them very frequently, once or twice a week, and unless you have this close relationship with them, uh, that becomes a burden on them to try to, to understand each, each article they read or each thing they Google on, on, on the web. Um, and this is, I think, is very important for, for their quality of life, because, and, and, because they, they go on through their journey with, with ease, knowing that they're being cared for and that their concerns and questions are, are answered. Thank you so much for sharing that. And listen, Rana Bitar, I appreciate you joining me today for the podcast. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and giving insights into the work that you do. And I respect your perspective on healthcare. Thanks for listening to Perspectives on Healthcare. Visit PerspectivesOnHealthcare.com to learn more about Rob Oliver or to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If this podcast was valuable, we'd appreciate a review on iTunes. Or if you tell a friend or coworker about the show, that would be helpful too. Join us again next time for more Perspectives on Healthcare.